You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Pakistan Army posts comes under deadly attacks in Balochistan. TDP's widening alliances and improved internal cohesion poses a major threat to Pakistan. And Taliban attempting to erase women from public life. Let's begin the show with Pakistan, where the Baloch insurgents armed with bombs and guns attacked two military bases overnight, killing several soldiers in the latest violence in the resource-rich southwestern Balochistan province. The attacks came hours before Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan arrived in Beijing for the opening of Winter Olympics. A report. The Pakistani gunship helicopters were seen in and around Panjgur and Nushki in Balochistan after the heavy bombardment carried out on several buildings inside the Pakistan Frontier Corps headquarters. The Baloch Liberation Army took responsibility of the attacks, saying its suicide bombers had detonated explosive-laden vehicles at the entrance of the military bases. The group claimed to neutralize more than 100 Pakistani military personnel. Meanwhile, the Pakistan military's media wing Inter-Services Public Relations denied the intensity of the attack and declared a reduced number of persons killed. The attack came a day before Prime Minister Imran Khan left for the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympic Games in Beijing, where he is supposed to meet Chinese President Xi Jinping and other leaders. ये एक वाक्य नहीं है अभी जाफराबाद में आर्मी के ऊपर हमला करके दो फौजी मार दिए सत्रह जख्मी हुए इसके अलावा एक और सेपरेट इंसिडेंट में बलोच फ्रीडम फाइटर्स ने बलोच रिपब्लिकन गार्ड नाम से एक ऑर्गेनाइजेशन है उसने डेरा मुराद जमाली में दो फौजियों को मार दिया इकतीस जनवरी को ये रोज की बुनियाद पे हो रहा है Balochistan, which is volatile and rife with historical tensions, has witnessed regular insurgencies since Pakistan annexed the autonomous Baloch state of Kalat in 1948. Baloch groups have targeted security forces in regular raids across the province, demanding their rights and independence for ethnic Baloch areas of the province. The common people in the province have been experiencing various forms of atrocities caused due to illegal state activities. They are often kidnapped and killed by military, police and paramilitary forces. Independent journalists, doctors and civil rights activists are being targeted by authorities and the state intelligence wing is playing a nefarious role in such incidents. The tension has further been stoked by the Chinese investments under Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative, which have never reached to the locals. Separatist groups have frequently targeted Chinese construction in Gwadar, a port on the Balochistan coast near the entrance to the strategically important Gulf. They are clear now that the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor project is the way to ruin the people of Balochistan. वो इसलिए हो रहा है कि पाकिस्तान बलूचिस्तान में नेचुरल रिसोर्स पे खूब एक्सप्लेटेशन कर रहा है और बलोच की जो दौलत है वो लूटे जा रहे हैं पंजाबी फौजी वैसे तो पेट्रोल गैस और दूसरे नेचुरल रिसोर्स हैं वो दबा के एक्सप्लेट किए जा रहे हैं और कोई रोकने वाला नहीं कोई पूछने वाला नहीं है और वो दौलत कहाँ जाती है कि बलूचिस्तान में तो लोगों के पास कोई भी सहूलियत नहीं है बेसिक ह्यूमन राइट्स नहीं है बेसिक ह्यूमन नीड्स जो होती हैं वो पूरी नहीं होती वह ना बिजली है ना गैस है साफ पीने का पानी नहीं है अस्पताल नहीं है 
मेडिकल फैसिलिटीज नहीं है एजुकेशन फैसिलिटीज नहीं है बेसिक स्कूल्स नहीं है यूनिवर्सिटी कॉलेजेस तो छोड़ें बलोच हैव फेस्ड एक्सट्रीम डेप्रिवेशन एंड मार्जिनलाइजेशन फ्रॉम पाकिस्तान एंड इट हैज रिजल्टेड इन अ स्ट्रॉन्ग डिजायर फॉर लिबरेशन अमंग देम डेमोन्स्ट्रेशन अगेंस्ट टारगेटेड किलिंग्स एंड फेक एनकाउंटर्स आर ऑफन हेल्ड इन बलोचिस्तान एंड इन वेस्टर्न कंट्रीज The protesters holding play cards and banners chant slogans against inhuman atrocities in Pakistan's resource-rich province. They are urging the international community to speak out against the genocide as the silence of the world community is giving impunity to Pakistan. Islamabad, which had developed an inflated sense of pride in its leadership, post taliban return to power in afghanistan last august had found itself in a spot to bother in fact the situation is worse than that reason ttp tehreek e taliban pakistan a taliban offshoot which continues to enjoy its patronage has unleashed itself ruthlessly in the past 6 months contrary to what the pakistan establishment had planned and predicted ttp has reconciled with its splinters has formed new alliances with small insurgent groups and is targeting islamabad security apparatus systematically islamabad has failed in striking a ceasefire deal with the group and is appearing to witness even more blood on its way in the coming days what the world witnessed with a sense of great disbelief mid august last year was hailed across Pakistan as a major geopolitical triumph. The withdrawal of US troops and the Taliban's return to power has reinvigorated a downcast and isolated Pakistan leadership at a time when it was striving to save its sagging economy. Prime Minister Imran Khan went a step ahead and said that Afghans had broken the shackles of slavery, completely disregarding the previous dispensation of Ashraf Ghani. and rolling a red carpet for the Taliban. Cut to February 2022. The situation has turned upside down. What Islamabad believed, leverage has come back to haunt it. In less than 6 months, the cruel realities of the Taliban rule are staring Pakistan in the face. The group's victory has paved way for groups like Tehreek-e-Taliban Pakistan to escalate the attacks with impunity. The recent attack on a police picket in the capital of Islamabad is one among the several instances when TTP attacked the security personnel. Anybody who's ever supported a terrorist organization should know the concept of a blowback. Remember, uh this isn't the first time that Pakistani terror assets have turned on Pakistan. Uh they have a long history. Uh, of turning on Pakistan and in a way it suits Pakistani propaganda because the more bombs that explode in Pakistan uh you know they can say oh we are the biggest victims of terror and this is a card they've played over and over again i think the problem right now is that the expected blowback is getting out of hand uh they expected some kind of a peace dividend because you know now uh america's not there in afghanistan and that is not happening and what is worse is that the haqqani network seems to be doing to pakistan what pakistan did to afghanistan you can carry out your attacks here but please do it quietly don't flaunt our support openly and we will keep denying it uh, publicly as the gradual withdrawal of us troops commenced last year it wasn't just the taliban that began capturing territories ttp2 stepped up its attacks in tribal areas along the pakistan border august The month when US troops pulled out completely proved to be most dreadful as the group mounted as many as 35 attacks killing 52 civilians in one month alone. This was Pakistan's highest casualty figure since 2017. As per the Pakistan Institute for Peace Studies and Islamabad based research organization, the TTP carried out 95 attacks last year killing 140 people. The attacks have taken a huge toll on the law enforcement agencies of Pakistan as scores have slain the previous year. Apart from these, most of the cross-border attacks from Afghanistan in 2021 were also perpetrated by the Tehreek-e-Taliban Pakistan. 
The government of Pakistan has gone on record stating the country has witnessed a 35% surge in terrorism attacks since August, with most of them carried out by TTP. It is uh, largely an ethnic-based group, but very smartly what they've done is uh, they are claiming to be an Islamic group. Remember, Pakistan's whole problem has been that it has always said that religion will trump ethnicity or language. So what the TTP does is it presents a two-front challenge to the uh, Pakistani state because one, it undermines a very, very important ethnicity, uh, ethnic component of Pakistan, which is the Pashtuns. And the second, it does so not using ethnicity as much as religion. Uh, because if you look at all the recent statements coming out, including by the spokespersons in uh, uh, Afghanistan proper, uh, they've been saying that they don't consider Pakistan to be an Islamic state and Pakistan is highly un-Islamic and things like that. So what you're seeing right now is a fundamental challenge to the Pakistan, to the idea of Pakistan, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, as we would have it. Another factor behind TTP's massive resurgence is also its improved organizational skills. TTP has just not maintained its historical ties with the Taliban but has also reconciled with these splinters that were operating separately for years. They have also formed new alliances with little-known insurgent factions operating in Pakistan. Reports say that different TDP leaders have also ironed out their differences in order to keep their focus intact. And now, an even stronger TDP has doubled down on its efforts to destabilize Pakistan. Not to mention, they have had a fair amount of success in recent months. And now the Pakistan leaders, who believe for a brief phase that it was them who were writing the rules in the land, which is popularly called the graveyard of empires, are left to grappling with the internal security threats posed by TTP. Observers say Pakistan's story skid before it could take off. It is securing more losses than it could have ever imagined and it seemed to have lost the war before it could make its first move. Let's move to Afghanistan, where the Taliban leaders are institutionalizing large-scale and systematic gender-based discrimination and violence against women and girls. The world is deeply troubled by the harsh manner with which the de facto authorities have responded to Afghan women and girls claiming their fundamental rights, with reports of peaceful protesters having been often beaten. Take a look. Until a few months ago, Afghanistan's own national flag was waving in the sky. But now, the Taliban is rebranding the war-torn country with its white flags. The country is no longer a republic, it's the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. The de facto rulers want to make sure that nobody can forget who is in charge now. With Taliban seizing power, the human rights situation in the country deteriorated drastically, especially for women and girls. Despite the Taliban's claim that they had changed their policies on women's participation in society, this was proved to be false. Women have been excluded from public life with no opportunity for education, unable to join the workforce and no access to health care unless accompanied by a man. This has put in effect gender apartheid. The UN agencies and the international community have also raised concern over the situation. Recently, EU Parliament hosted Afghan Women Days to address and cast light on the extremely worrying situation of women in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan over the last two decades, girls and women gained increased access to their rights to education and to full and productive roles in society. Today, sadly, these same women and girls have had these hopes cruelly taken away from them once more. 
the rollbacks on rights to employment, education, freedom of movement, and enjoyment of dignity and freedom from violence have been exacerbated by an economic situation that threatens levels of famine and poverty on an unfathomable scale. Without full participation in public life, women's access to essential services will be even further curtailed. The women of Afghanistan, as well as the countries of the region and beyond, are yearning for stability. A few days ago, some Taliban leaders traveled first class on a plane specially chartered by the Norwegian government to Oslo for meetings with Western officials and members of Afghan civil society. The talks were focused on Afghanistan's humanitarian crisis, but the meeting was also a part of new diplomatic efforts to seek international recognition. Women activists who have been facing intimidation by the Taliban after staging small and scattered protests are outraged by the diplomatic efforts. They are feeling betrayed as Western countries have started laying red carpets for the Taliban when the latter group has failed to live up to its promise. People in the country are being denied their rights. Some of the women's rights activists are still missing in the country. And the UN Human Rights Office has shown concern over the continued disappearance of people who were abducted in connection with recent women's rights protests. When I and many of other my fellow Afghans, when we are trying to come to the Europe, we have to fill a form and we have to say that I have not been a terrorist, I have not been trained in a terrorist camp, I have not participated in acts of genocide and war crimes, and I have not been known by any other name. My question is that when the delegates of the Taliban came to Oslo, what did they write in their visa form? What did they write in their visa application? And I really want an answer now from the members of the parliament, because this is a disgrace to see that we as human rights defenders, we have to answer all those questions, but then you are extending a red carpet for a group that is known not only for their terrorist activities, not only known for their being a gender apartheid regime, but at the same time, more than half of their cabinet members of the, on the UN terrorist sanction list. Afghanistan has gone back to a past it didn't miss. The Taliban have increasingly cracked down on dissent and local journalists have been beaten and intimidated while covering protests. Recently, two reporters, Waris Hasrat and Aslam Hijab, were also detained by the Taliban. Both of them were later released after mass outrage. The international community is waking up to the harsh truth once again. It has no clear strategy for dealing with the Islamists and the new reality emerging in Afghanistan. The people of Afghanistan do not deserve this. Pakistan has always treated Kashmir as a playground for its jihadist terror activities. Parked back terror groups through regular infiltration, the radicalization of local youth, killing innocent people and several terror attacks have kept the situation tense in the Union territory for several years. However, since the abrogation of Article 370, Indian security forces have managed to foil all its devious agendas and maintain tranquility in the valley. Islamabad's executive wing specializing in terrorism received a huge setback as Indian security forces eliminated top terrorist and Jaish e Mohammed commander Zahid Bani along with three other terrorists in an overnight encounter. Zahid Bani, one of the key commanders after Lambu and Samir Das, was arrested in Srinagar in 2016 for harboring two Tehreek-e Ul Mujahideen terrorists, Danish and Mujiz. Extremely radical and a hardcore jihadi, Bani had arranged camouflage gear for those two other terrorists. He became the top Jaish commander in South Kashmir after security forces killed Pulwama attack mastermind Samir Das last year. The other three terrorists killed in the Pulwama encounter have been identified as Wahid e Reishi, Inayat e Ullah Meir, and Kafil Akka Chotu, a Pakistan based terrorist. 
पुलवा में चार टेरिस्ट मारे गए जिसमें जो जाहिद वानी हम सब जानते हैं जे का टॉप कमांडर था और इसका भाई भी जज जो है मीर जो की बन प्लाजा अटैक में इन्वॉल्व था अभी जेल बंद है और उसी का भाई जाहिद वानी है 2017 से एक्टिव था बहुत सारे किलिंग में इन्वॉल्व था रिक्रूटमेंट में इन्वॉल्व था और समीर डाड़ के मरने के बाद यह डिस्ट्रिक्ट कमांडर था इनफैक्ट कि जे का चीफ था पूरे वैली का India's timely interventions on the border have left Pakistan deeply worried as there have been a significant drop in the infiltration of terrorists from across the border due to the strict vigil of Indian security forces in the Kashmir valley a total of 439 terrorists have been eliminated in Jammu and Kashmir so far after the abrogation of article 370 while there have been 541 terror related incidents in the union territory According to the Ministry of State of Home Affairs, 42 terrorist organizations have been listed in the first schedule under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. After the abrogation of Article 370 and 35A, the people of Kashmir have realized that their fate, their lives are all entwined with the Indian nation. What has happened now is that these people have risen against militancy and they are the ones who are helping the security forces in eliminating all these terrorists over there the moment any terrorist comes and hides or takes shelter in any house anywhere whether it is in the built up area whether it is in the forest or whether anywhere else he that information is immediately given to the jammu kashmir police which informs the security forces cordon and search operations are launched and the terrorist that is there if he does not surrender is eliminated that is why we find that the success rate of 439 in these two years is there after two years of abrogation of article 370 from jammu and kashmir the region has seen a significant development and relative peace however pakistan is turning no stone unturned to create unrest in the valley Despite international condemnation, Islamabad continues to send its proxies to infiltrate in the Kashmir Valley and create fear psychosis among the people. However, to its major disappointment, Indian security forces are well aware of Pakistan's nefarious propaganda and eliminating the terrorists entering from across the border. With that we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia we'll be back next week with more news views and analysis from the subcontinent meanwhile do keep writing to us at nwsa@anin.com this is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia goodbye and take care